This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to this virtual worship service with First Presbyterian Church of Fort Worth. We're so glad that you're present on this day, and we pray that our time together will deepen and grow our faith journeys together. Be sure to learn more about our church on our website, as well as register your attendance there or in the description of this video. We are worshiping in person with limited attendance, and you can find out more about those opportunities on our homepage under the Worship tab. Let us worship God in mind, body, and spirit. Please join me in the call to worship. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, alleluia. Blessing and honor is yours, O God. Glory to God forever, alleluia. Let us pray. We are your people, O God, the sheep of your pasture, the flock you have gathered. Lead us beside still waters, teach us the way of righteousness, and feed us through your word. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Good Shepherd. Amen. Our God is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and full of unfailing love. God is close to all who call on God, listening to the cries for help and offering salvation. Let us bring our confession to God, knowing that the Lord will hear our prayers and offer mercy. Let us pray together. Sovereign God, we confess that we are not ready for your holy realm. You guide us toward right paths, but we refuse to follow where you lead. You love and feed and care for us, but we fail to love and serve others. Forgive us, merciful God, so that we may return to your fold and rejoice in your presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Lamb upon the throne. Amen. However long we wander, however far we stray, God's steadfast love endures forever. Sisters and brothers, be assured, in Jesus Christ we are forgiven.
Let us pray. Lord God, good shepherd, by the leading of your spirit, help us listen to your voice and follow in your paths all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first reading is Ezekiel chapter 34, beginning in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Mortal, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God. Ah, you shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the sheep. You have not strengthened the weak. You have not healed the sick. You have not bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strayed. You have not sought the lost, but with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth, with no one to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, because my sheep have become a prey, and my sheep have become food for all the wild animals, since there was no shepherd, and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves, and have not fed my sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, I am against the shepherds, and I will demand my sheep at their hand, and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths, so that they may not be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the water courses, and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture, and they shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, First Prez kids. Happy Sunday. It is good to be with you all this morning. Grab your pillow, come closer to the TV or computer. This time is just for you. Christ is risen. Did you say Christ is risen indeed? That is right, it is still Easter. It is the fourth Sunday of Easter this week. And over the next several weeks, I want us to spend our time together exploring the sanctuary. Let's start over here by the stained glass. Stained glass is glass colored by adding metallic salt when it is made. The colored glass is made into stained glass windows. Small pieces of glass are arranged to form patterns or pictures. The glass is held together by strips of lead and supported by a rigid frame. You will see stained glass used for Christian art, but you might also see it other places too. A lot of times we use stained glass to tell the story in the Bible. And you will see here in the sanctuary that the top panel of the stained glass is from the Old Testament of the Bible. And down here on the bottom panels are from the New Testament and tell the story of Jesus's life. 
Do you see ones that you might recognize? Like Jesus' birth and him fishing with the disciples. And here he is gathering with a crowd of children. I encourage you to spend some time coloring a stained glass picture. What would it look like? What colors would you use? What story would you tell? Use the crayons or colored pencils that you have to draw it out. Let's go to God in prayer. You can repeat after me. Loving God, thank you for colorful art that tells us your story of love. Amen. Grace and peace. Good morning. Welcome to worship. We're so glad you're with us once again. Um, today I'm trying something new. We're recording from new cameras. And so as we're working on the live stream, we actually have some new cameras set up around the sanctuary that we're testing out for the first time today. Uh, we're still not quite ready for the live stream to take place, but we have some cameras that we're starting to play with, and it's very exciting and it's very new. Um, seems to fit the theme of the season, since we're still in the season of Easter, right? We're still in the season of Easter. Uh, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Uh, we're still in the season of Easter. And today, according to the lectionary calendar, today is the fourth Sunday of Easter. Uh, now, the fourth Sunday of Easter season is often called the Good Shepherd Sunday. Good Shepherd Sunday, and this has to do with the text relating to us having a good shepherd. Um, today, I thought we'd talk a little bit about a good shepherd. Um, after being four weeks into Easter, we don't often need a reminder that we have a good shepherd, uh, but sometimes we do need a reminder why we need a good shepherd. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, before we get started, before we get too far, uh, join me in a word of prayer, and then I'll read the passage for us. Lord, we have come seeking you this morning, knowing that you are near, and believing that you want to be found. But God, we also know that you are seeking us, and it is in that knowledge that we ask you now, come to us. Speak to us. Illumine us. We love you, Lord. Amen. A reading from Matthew chapter 18. What do you think? If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over it more than the other 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We get the setting in our story today that Jesus tells very quickly, it comes very early on in the text. It says, a shepherd has a hundred sheep. A shepherd has a hundred sheep. Now, I think we've totally romanticized the notion of shepherds in our modern day cultural climate. I think we've totally romanticized this notion. You see, real shepherds back in the day, they were unbathed, they were smelly, and they were covered in sheep fluids. I'm going to give you just a minute to let that image fester in your minds for a minute. Covered in sheep fluids. Now, they were out there in the elements, uh, day and night, these shepherds. They were out there with their sheep. They were sleeping out there. They were eating out there. They were living out there, out there with the sheep and all the real life unpleasantries that sheep can bring with them, like watching where you step, the constant buying and the bleeding, the attraction of predators. They were out there and all of that. But that's not what we think about when we think about shepherds, is it? 
That's not what we think about, especially when the Bible mentions shepherds, is it? No, more often than not, we think of David, the strapping young lad out there, majestically watching over his father's sheep up on the mountain as the breeze wafts in his hair and you get this subtle smile and this holy glow about him. You think of David on that mountain, or you think of the angels appearing to the shepherds on a very different mountain, and the angels appearing in this silent, serene hillside scene, instructing them to go see the child that is born and placed in a manger. Think about the fact that a real-life shepherd, fresh from the fields, would not be anywhere near a newborn baby these days anymore, would they? No, there are some things that hand sanitizer just won't cover, right? Right. You see, being a shepherd was not always pleasant. And being a shepherd was hardly ever easy. And Jesus said that this shepherd, this shepherd in particular in our story today, this shepherd has a hundred sheep. A hundred sheep. A hundred sheep is a lot. A hundred is a lot. Uh, Now, my Meg is a kindergarten teacher. She teaches kindergarten, and because of all the COVID delays this year with schools and with quarantines and with starting late and all that stuff, uh, in their kindergarten class, they just celebrated their 100th day of school, 100 days in kindergarten. Uh, Now, this is a big deal when you're in kindergarten. This is a big deal in that classroom on that day. Uh, They do activities all around the number 100. They bring in stuff that's 100. They do all this stuff. They've been doing it for a very long time uh, because I remember doing this on the 100th day of my kindergarten class. Um, I remember the homework assignment that night that we had to get ready for before we went in. We had to bring in a collection of something, a collection of 100 of something. We wanted to bring it in the next day so we could visualize what 100 looked like. A couple of kids brought in 100 pennies. It was kind of boring. 100 pennies doesn't really do much. Uh, One girl brought in 100 pieces of candy. Uh, She was uh, very uh, impressed that day. Um, Everybody was very much wanting to sit by her on that day. Um, But I, myself, I brought in 100 baseball cards. Um, Any other baseball card collectors out there? I love me some baseball cards. I sat down with my dad the night before and we picked out a hundred of my favorites. We picked out a hundred of my favorite baseball cards. And I remember when we got to school the next day, the teacher wanted us to lay out our collection, to visualize what a hundred looks like, lay out our collection on our desk so that we can walk around and look at what a hundred looks like. And so I get the cards and I start laying them out and I say, one, two, three, four, Five, and it didn't take me very long to figure out a hundred baseball cards don't fit on the desk that is sized for a kindergartner. It just wasn't going to work. And so I remember there about the time I got to five or six or seven, I remembered I just broke down and did what any normal kindergartner would do at that time and just started sobbing uncontrollably sobbing. I was just crying and I was weeping. And I remember the teacher coming running over and he said, Brian, what's wrong? Brian, what is it? Brian, what happened? And I said, a hundred is just too many. It's just too many. A hundred is a whole lot. And it is. A hundred is a whole lot. We forget how many a hundred is. And sheep, a hundred sheep? Well, that's a lot of sheep. Think about watching and guarding and protecting and tending to a hundred sheep. That's a lot of sheep. Think about keeping track of all of them. Think about keeping an eye on all of them as they grazed and then as they moved in different directions. Keeping them safe and healthy and together. A hundred is a lot of sheep. A hundred is a lot of lives to be responsible for. I've got a did you know for you. Did you know? This is a fact. Cruise ships consider it a successful cruise when they return to their final destination, their final port, with at least 97% of the people they started with. Uh, True story. 
true story. Now, you see, those of you who have been on cruises, you can imagine this with me, and if you haven't, just think through this for a minute. Cruise ships have a lot of people on them, right? They have a whole lot of people packed on these boats, and then they go out, and they make all these stops. They stop at these different places along the way, and every time they stop, people get off the boat, and they go out to enjoy themselves. Now, Sometimes, I know none of you, sometimes people go out and they enjoy themselves a little too much at these stops, right? Right. They go out and they enjoy themselves a little too much at these places, and so uh, they don't make it back on time. And these cruise ships are huge, and so they can't wait for everyone. They can't wait all day. And so at every stop, more often than not, they usually leave someone behind. They usually don't have everyone getting back on the ship. And so their formula that they use, their formula for a successful cruise, true story, is that they return to their final destination with at least 97% of the people they started out with. Now, when I first learned the statistic, and so before every trip we would take, I would count up the kids who were going and then I would tell the parents how many I could lose and still call it a successful youth trip. Um, I don't know why they didn't like me at that church. I don't know why I didn't last long there. I can't figure that one out. 97% seems pretty good though, right? It's a solid A. It might even be an A plus if you have a generous grader there. Seems like a pretty good number. If a cruise ship can be proud of 97%, well, then I would think a shepherd ought to be proud of that as well, right? Because a hundred sheep, well, that's just a lot of sheep. In our story so far, what we've got is a shepherd that has a hundred sheep. But you see what happens next. Something goes awry. Something gets complicated, because we learn very quickly after that that one of them has gone astray, the text says. One of them has gone astray. And so the shepherd rather abruptly has only 99 sheep with him and one no more. Now, 100 is a big number. 99 is a big number because 97 is still a big number, right? But one, well, one isn't a really big number at all. But for some reason to this shepherd, one is a really big deal. We're not told specifically what happened with that lone lost sheep. We do not know if the sheep simply wandered too far. We don't know if the sheep ran off in search of something different, something more, something better. We don't know if this is a teenager sheep in the midst of an angst-ridden rebellion against the shepherd. We don't know. We just don't know. All we really know is that out of the 100, it says one of them has gone astray. I do want you to notice something, though. I do want you to notice there is some agency in what the sheep has done here. The text doesn't say the sheep was lost. No, the text says the sheep has gone astray. The sheep is the subject, not the object here. That means the sheep is the one acting here, meaning that the sheep at some level was a willing participant in all of this, meaning that the sheep was not lost solely because of someone else's efforts. The sheep in some manner was consciously choosing to go down that stray path. And I don't know about you, but the phrase, gone astray, it just doesn't sit well with me. It has these certain sinful undertones to it. Missing the mark, falling away, going astray. It has this uncomfortably close resonance with me. You see, I know I mess up. I know I fall short. And this just isn't in the corporate communal kind of way. This is true in the daily personal kind of way as well. I know this. And so the phrase gone astray seems to strike this dissonant chord within me. And I would bet I'm not alone in that. John Calvin writes this in his Institutes. He says, not just a slight number have gone astray 
but every one of us. Every one of us. Now hear me on this. I do think there are situations beyond our control that can lead us down very dangerous paths in our lives. I do think that. I also think that there are moments and people and circumstances that can unwillingly guide and move and overpower us. I do think that as well. But I don't think that's what our passage is talking about today. Unfortunately, it hits way closer to home than that. You see, this passage is about a sheep who in some way, shape, or form goes astray because of his, her, their own doing. And we sophisticated, mainline, mainstream Presbyterians, we don't really like to talk about this stuff too much, do we? It doesn't feel dignified. It doesn't feel decent. It doesn't feel in order. And we know that we're totally depraved, but we like to think that we're pretty decent most of the time, right? You see, we might do the right thing 99 times. But I guess there is still that one in a hundred in which we might do something that could be described as going astray. Maybe it's something that we did wrong. Maybe it's something that we didn't do right. Maybe it's something around us that we shouldn't have ignored. Maybe it's something within us that we shouldn't have indulged. Maybe it's something that we've justified to ourselves as okay, or maybe it's something that we've rationalized to our friends as not that bad. We've all had some agency in going astray on our journey, though, whether it's through something that we've done or left undone, said or left unsaid. We've all had some agency in going astray on our journey. And so, unfortunately, all of us, every one of us, can identify in some way, shape, or form with the phrase, and one of them has gone astray. I love the beginning of this passage, too. At the very beginning of this passage, Jesus very plainly asks a question. Um, he says, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Jesus very plainly asks the question, what do you think? And then he tells a story about a shepherd who goes on a search to find the sheep so that together they can rejoice. Search, find, rejoice. What do you think? Jesus is talking to the disciples at this point, and the disciples are still trying to figure out Jesus. Jesus is trying to help them along. Jesus is trying to help them out, giving them clues about the kingdom, showing them a fresh perspective on life. And Jesus now wants to know if the disciples are getting any of it. Do they understand any of it? And so Jesus asked the question, what do you think? I think our answer to that question is completely wrapped up with who we identify with in this story, right? Who we choose to identify ourselves with in this story that Jesus is telling. You see, if I connect myself as a shepherd, if I connect myself to this story as a fellow herder of sheep, and I hear a story about one who chased the stray that chose to leave, one who left the 99 to go in search of the one lost, one who endangered the whole herd for a single sheep, what do I think? Protect your investment. Watch over your assets. Do any sort of basic cost analysis. If I'm a shepherd, what do I think? I think this guy's crazy. I'd stay with the 99. If I choose to connect myself in a different way, though, if I choose to connect myself as one of the 99 sheep, one of the sheep who stayed put, one of the sheep who did as it was told, if I hear a story about a shepherd who seemed abandonedly faithful, seemed to leave them alone, a shepherd who left them to go after another, a shepherd who apparently cared more about one than all the rest as it appeared to us, what do I think? 
I think stay with those who listened. I think stay with those who don't cause you trouble. Stay with those who stayed with you. What do I think? If I'm one of the 99, I think this story is backwards. I think you stay put, shepherd. But if I connect myself as the lost sheep in this story, and remember, we can all identify in some way, shape, or form, each and every one of us with that lost sheep. If I choose to connect myself to this story as the lost sheep, well, then this story suddenly becomes very good news, doesn't it? I got another did you know for you, another fact for you. Did you know that a sheep can only see six feet away? The eyes, the visual that a sheep has, a sheep can only see six feet at a time. Now, if I've learned anything in this pandemic, if I learned anything at all in this pandemic, it's that people don't always understand what six feet looks like. And so we're gonna test out the video capabilities today because I wanna give you a visual. Uh, not everyone understands what six feet is. Um, I wore my tall shoes today, and so I'm exactly six foot tall. I'm exactly six feet tall. This is what six feet looks like. That's the distance from here to the table in the middle there. So that's, that's about six feet right there. It's me down the stairs. And so here's about six feet right here. That is six feet away. How far can a sheep see? Six feet. You know what that means? How does a sheep go astray? Six feet at a time. That's right. That's right. A sheep might say like, ooh, green grass. Six feet. A sheep might say like, ooh, fresh water. Six feet. Sheep might say, ooh, open pasture. Six feet. How does a sheep get lost? Six feet at a time. That's right. Now, here's what I want to say to you today. Here's what I think happens more often than not. I think that in our lives, we more often go six feet away going astray also. We might say things like, well, it's not that bad. Six feet. Or we might say things like, oh, I can rationalize that. Six feet. Or I might say things like, well, all my friends are doing it. Six feet. Friends, how do we get lost? More often than not, I think it's six feet at a time. Now, here's a question for you. Here's a question I want to ask you right now. How far do you think I've gone? How far have I gone at this point traveling out here? Do you think it's like, 30 feet, you think it's like 40 feet, 50 feet, 60 feet, how far do you think I've gone there? It doesn't really matter if you think about it because how far can I see? If I'm a sheep all the way out here, how far can I see right now? Six feet, that's it. I'm way more than six feet, aren't I? And now I'm out here all by myself, I'm lost and alone and I can only see six feet. Oh no, what am I gonna do? I'm lost and I'm afraid and I'm lonely and, and I don't know what to do because I can't see where I'm supposed to be anymore. I'm so far out here. What is my only hope at this point? What is my only promise and hope and thing that I pray for at this point? I need someone who's going to notice that I'm gone. I need someone who's going to call to me. I need someone who's going to come to me. I need someone who loves me enough to risk it all and come to rescue me at this point. I need someone who's going to search. I need someone who's going to find. And I need someone who wants to rejoice with me. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. When I'm lost and gone astray, when I'm lost and gone astray, when I'm lost and gone astray, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. 
Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Give me Jesus. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. Hear the good news on this Good Shepherd Sunday. Do we have a shepherd? Yes, we have a shepherd. Do we have a good shepherd? Yes, we have a good shepherd. Jesus tells us this story, but God has long before promised us this. We have a good shepherd. This is not new news. This is Jesus' gentle reminder to the disciples and to us. We have a good shepherd. In Ezekiel, we read, For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep. I will seek them out. As shepherds search for their flocks when they are scattered among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. We have a shepherd. Amen? Amen. I will rescue them, it says. I will bring them out, it says. I will feed them, it says. We have a shepherd. Amen? Amen. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak. No matter how far we've gone, we have a good shepherd. No matter how far we've strayed, we have a good shepherd. No matter how distanced we've become, we have a good shepherd. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel on this day. We have have a good shepherd, one who will search, one who will find, and one who rejoices over us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, all God's children said, Amen. Please join me in affirming our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Oh.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we praise you that your glory is all around us as we live into this Easter season. We rejoice that the grave could not hold your son and that he has conquered death, risen to rule over all the powers of this earth. In him is the hope of the world. We confirm our hope in Jesus Christ and we pray for your world. Where there is violence and warfare and threats of war, we pray for peace. Where there is hunger, homelessness, and want, we pray for all the necessities of life that give human dignity. Where there is uncertainty and anxiety about the future, we pray for clarity and resolve so that all may live together in peace and justice, lifted up by our Easter hope and joy. Loving Lord, Good Shepherd, we praise you that you summon us to new life, to follow you with joy and gladness. Help us listen to your voice. And for words we have spoken or actions we've taken that have hurt others, forgive us. For love withheld or mercy lacking, forgive us. For thoughts that lead to hardness of heart, forgive us. Create in each of us new life this day, that listening to your voice, we will faithfully follow you into a new and joyful future. By your Spirit, set our feet in your holy way, that our lives may be signs of your life, and all we have may show forth your love. Teach us once again to trust in the power of the resurrection, that we may proclaim in word and deed that our lives are in your loving, triumphant care, that justice and peace can be realities that you're always seeking us and all you love as a shepherd cares for the flock. Be especially present with those this day who need to know deep down the power of your love, those who are sick, those who are dying, those who are grieving, those who are struggling with addictions, those who ache over broken relationships, those who are seeking peace within themselves, and those we hold dear in our hearts. O oh God, we offer our prayers this morning as your gathered church joined with the faithful throughout the world who celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ, and we renew our commitment to him. So strengthen your church that we would be a bold and joyful witness in every corner of the globe and among all peoples, that all may come to know of your deep abiding love. And God, bless the Presbyterian Church USA in her mission and ministry and bless this congregation. Overwhelm us with joy and hope this day and all days as we respond as Christ's faithful disciples. It is in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen one, our good shepherd, that we pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, this is the good news. Jesus Christ is our good shepherd, always seeking us, finding us, and loving us. So listen this week for the voice of the shepherd and follow him into the world. And go with the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen.